Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce Andrea Mioli to those of you who don't really know him. Um, Andrea is a specialist in the contemporary market from Christie's, and we're incredibly lucky to have him come and join us this evening. Andrea, I'll hand over to you with no further ado, and we look forward to hearing about fair warning. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nicola, and the whole team here in Newlands for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor um, to be in such a lovely space. Um, and um, I'm here to talk to you this evening, uh, as you can see from behind me, uh, a, a quick kind of discussion about the contemporary art market. Uh, I'm working at Christie's uh, and coming from an auction perspective. It will be slightly tinged with that um, um, uh, insights into the commercial um, uh, aspects of, of the um, of the talk, but we'll, we'll kind of dis discuss some of the kind of demystifying aspects of um, of the auction market, how we handle the contemporary artworks and artists that come through our doors, and uh, how we've evolved in the recent years with all the changes and upheavals that we've had um, to our uh, um, our framework and also just society at large. And then we'll touch upon how some of those aspects have uh, permeated popular culture um, through things like film, music. Uh, fashion and, and social media. So just by way of introduction, uh, as Nicholas said, my name is Andrea. I work in the uh, post-war and contemporary department uh, at Christie's. I'm a specialist there. Um, and uh, I'll probably, we call it PWC within the, within Christie's. So uh, if I slip into that uh, lingo, please, it's not PricewaterhouseCoopers. Yeah. We're not talking about accounting <laughs> or, uh, or, uh, or auditing um, post-war and contemporary. So uh, I, 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 that's a little caveat for now. So what, we'll, um, what we do in the department essentially is that we look at artists that um, were born or came to their zenith in their um, specific areas post-war, so post-1940s um, up to the present day. So we deal with anybody um, within that remit. It's a very fluid and quite difficult way to kind of uh, understand the delineation between departments because we also have an impressionist and modernist department. Uh, we also have a modern British department. And so it's not necessarily something that's, uh, there's a very hard line between these aspects. But just to give you an idea of, of the world that, that, that I'm coming in uh, from, I joined Christie's three years ago, so about a month before everything went into lockdown. Uh, so not great timing for me. Um, but um, in a way, I've, it's, it's given me a kind of insight into how um, Christie's and how the auction market has slightly changed within that time and how we've had to grapple with really some quite large obstacles um, uh, that have come our way. Uh, before that, I used to work in a completely different industry in the financial sector. So I'll bring hopefully a little bit of uh, that perspective to it. And then um, I worked at the National Portrait Gallery for a while, which uh, I'm very proud to, 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 uh, to have been there in the past because in June they'll be reopening their doors. Um, so I urge you all to go and have a look uh, when that happens because it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful um, space. I've just had a sneak preview of the galleries. It's going to look really, really wonderful. So uh, by all means, go there. So post-war and contemporary. This is just a quick a slide to show you um, where we are. We're in London at King Street as our headquarters. Um, th these are our galleries. We uh, have offices all over the world. Um, New York is really the, um, uh, in, in, in all, I think, art, not just auction term, but art term is probably the epicenter of where things are sold and bought. So even though our uh, headquarters have always been in London uh, and Kirk Christie's is a, is a UK company, L New York is where we really tend to sell our top, top works and where majority of our top works get sent. Um, in Europe, um, we have London, we have Paris, uh, we sell out of Milan, we sell out of Amsterdam. Um, and so we have a lot of great um, um, presence uh, um, in Europe, but really, and I'm saying I'm saying this because I'll caveat also uh, that in two weeks' time we have an incredible week of auctions uh, in New York with some fantastic collections, which we'll touch on later. But post-war and contemporary, or PWC, as I put there, um, what is it? And this is this is where I, it becomes quite difficult because I'm just using here some updated or uh, uh, um, contemporary versions of. Um, Alfred J. Barr's famous um, 1936 uh, uh, manifesto or organizational chart of uh, um, Cubism and abstract art, which since uh, has become quite difficult and problematic to kind of place within um, a contemporary setting. But just to give you an idea that these, these, these 
areas that we're talking about, about post-war and contemporary art, they're quite fluid. But I always thought it was quite interesting because when I was at the court they always said you should never use organizational charts for any artwork or any art uh, movement and how they discuss with each other. But it's actually quite interesting to look at because what we're going to be looking at today is how the contemporary fits alongside the post-war. So the post-war, the blue chip artists that we all know and love from Francis Bacon to David Hockney um, to Lucio Fontana or Yves Klan to the contemporary artists that are in a way, obviously, uh, and this is uh, my court told the professor turning, <laughs> berating me, but influencing constantly the, the, the contemporary generation. And so this is where I wanted to start off with, to look at this and to look at just really quickly a couple of headline statistics as uh, with regards to Christie's. So Christie's is, is, is splits its, um, its auctions really within three major formats. The evening sale, which is um, no longer in the evening, sadly, it's at like 2 p.m., because we try to, so we should call it really, it doesn't sound as nice afternoon sale, um, after lunch sale maybe. Um, but really because of London's strategic location within the 24 hour um, global day, we really realized uh, post COVID that actually placing our auction, evening auction in the afternoon, we really get as much as attention from the, the ending of the day in Asia as to the start of the day in New York. So it's actually a very strategic location for us. Um, and so the evening sale is really the kind of over 500,000 um, pounds uh, estimate value works that we would, we would place. Um, that's also a very fluid uh, level because in New York, it might be different to what it is in Amsterdam. Uh, but really, it's, it's the kind of top end of the lots. Um, then we have the day sale, which is a large volume sale, um, sometimes 150 plus lots. Uh, our last um, sale in February, you can see here is a kind of, uh, I don't want to kind of do too much competitive analysis against Sotheby's, but I had to bring this up. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, uh, but as you can see here, lots offered 153 to 93 at Sotheby's um, with uh, a percentage total of 112 million over nine. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's difficult because in the volume, high volume game of, of that core, what we call the core market, the day sale, there's a lot of what the artists that we're going to be looking at later, and a lot of the kind of collaborations and all of the impact that goes onto popular culture really happens within that space. And the new young contemporary artists that we bring in through the day sale, test the market for, and then perhaps then bring into the evening sale. And then last but not least, which my colleagues will never forgive me, is our first open sale. Uh, which is an online only sale that usually lasts for about two weeks. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the old Christie South Kensington branch, but it's essentially when we closed that office, we integrated the sales that would have been taking place there within the online sphere. And we'll touch upon this later when we talk about how COVID and especially the technological advancements have allowed us to move a lot more into the online space. Um, and so in here we have uh, again, a couple of statistics fr from the last year um, where we sold the, the highest uh, um, um, work at auction, uh, Andy Warhol's stage, um, shot stage at Blue Maryland in New York from the um, Doris and Thomas Amman collection, which was a huge moment for us. Um, Christie's realized seven out of the 12 highest prices at auction in 2022, so a huge amount. And you can see here as well some of the global bidding like I was referring to beforehand, London really is strategically placed to really draw on that. So a lot of the time when we say, well, I will send it to New York, it's more of a New York work. London in a way encapsulates all of that. So we will see some of our sales uh, really do encapsulate anything from Asian art to, to US art because of our location. So I just want to give you a quick roundup of that. I mean, Last, see, last sale that we had in London, the evening sale, the 20, 21st century evening sale in February 28th, uh, so bidders from 37 countries, um, 66 works were fresh to market, which is a huge number for us because it's one of the very important um, mitigating factors when we look at works that we bring to auction. Have they been at auction before? How much of these works are being churned through the market system? And because our clients are constantly looking for new, fresh works, things they haven't seen, they haven't seen come to auction. And 91% um, uh, sold by value. Um, so over 50% of the lots sold over the high estimate. So incredible results. We're very happy about that. But that's not all. Because in a way, the, the auction system is very public. It's very open. 
our clients don't necessarily want to sell everything by auction. So I have to make a small plug as well for my own department, which is the private sales department, which is something that started only about 2014 at Christie's. Uh, beforehand, we were purely an auction house that dealt with uh, auctions, um, events, and selling works um, during those events. Um, and these are some of the headline numbers uh, from our private sales department. What's interesting to note here is the fact that when we talk about contemporary artists and contemporary artworks, we'll look at later some of the, some of the perhaps maybe issues that we have with bringing a, a, an artist that's too young to come to market uh, or too fresh to the market. And private sales is a good avenue for that. Uh, we deal with a lot of institutions, difficult artworks, that we, we, we always have kind of a commercial hat on when we look at the works that we consign to um, um, auction. And so therefore, the 15 meter high Keith Haring um, sculpture that can only go outside uh, or the seven hour video um, art installation that's very difficult to place in auction. Sadly, we get burdened with some of that. But you know, we, we, we talk to a lot of institutions. We talk to a lot of institutions. And so that's, and, and they don't really like to work within the auction framework because for them it's too short of a lead time for them to make a decision at the time that we release our works, release our, our, our catalogs, and then the time for making a decision might be maybe a month's time with acquisition committees, boards, um, and all these different things to take into consideration. An institution will not be nimble enough to make a decision to buy works at auction. Um, so private sales is another option that we, we, we work with, um, we have at Christie's, but um, to take into consideration. So, putting the contemporary in the PWC, post-war contemporary, not Price Water House Coopers. Um, this is the facade of um, the um, UCL, University College of London Slade School, which will be getting, gearing up for its um, um, summer shows for all of its graduates. Um, so, something that we look at very closely when we look at um, new artists and artists that are coming through the MFA programs, through the schools, London, I mean, not London, but just the UK is, in general is, is blessed with a lot of great institutions for students to, to learn um, uh, and apply their trade and learn their trade. So uh, it's, it's a great place to be, to look at these shows. And we always get together every spring and summer to have a look. And that's how one of the areas where we look at when we then perhaps down the line bring these artists to market. So the contemporary component of the contemporary in post-war contemporary is Roughly, we try to kind of look at it as 50-50. We want to bring those blue chip artists from the post-war period alongside the new contemporary artists. So we try to split the 50-50, but it's quite difficult because what does 50-50 mean? Um, Lot-wise, we've looked at the core market numbers for the day sale, 150 lots. Um, uh, obviously, there's the, 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 the post, the, 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 by value, um, we, it's, it's a lot more of a lower split on the contemporary side uh, because you sell one, um, David Hockney for uh, five million. That's a lot of contemporary wet paintings to sell um, in the core in the core group. So it's a little bit difficult, but we would try to balance it out. And what we did as well um, uh, a few years back is try to uh, bring together the post-war and contemporary sale, which was a standalone auction, and the modern uh, the modern and impressionist sale, uh, because we realized that actually the collecting ethos of most of our collectors does not is not delineated. Like I said, even beforehand within the Alfred J. Barr um, um, flowchart, it's not that easy. If somebody collects Picasso, they might also collect George Kondo. If somebody collects um, uh, Tony Cragg, they might also um, collect um, um, Richier. So there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, correlation in, in, in symbiosis there. So we decided to put the two together, and so now the evening sale um, is a split 50-50 between um, impressionist works and modern works and post-war contemporary. What, wh how do we structure a sale? So it's, 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 it's important to know how we're actually, um, um, how we do that. We, we look at that through looking at uh, a host of different uh, factors. One of them is obviously what gets consigned and what we know about from collections uh, th that we've looked at and valued in the past, anything that we want to go after that's new. So this is what we're gonna talk about now. Um, you know, we, we, we're constantly looking for um, new artists that are, that are uh, being, doing very well by selling in the primary market. The galleries obviously um, don't have infinite amount of supply. If you've had a career as long as uh, Bridget Riley's, 
um, you will have had a um, 70, 60 plus years of material that you can source from. Uh, whereas if you're graduating from Slade and then um, you're your first gallery show, there's obviously not so much material you can. So obviously galleries restrict the amount of um, uh, um, supply that's in, in the market. Uh, but we talk regularly to um, uh, the primary sector and get an understanding of what really uh, is doing well. And that relationship is really impor important with the primary market because um, at Christie's, we, we really pride ourselves on the level of expertise that we have and, and, and we undertake with the galleries. And so we want to make sure that, that relationship is always, always very, very, um, uh, very amicable. Um, and obviously we don't want to bring then an artist that is too young to the primary market to market because we've seen some issues with that in the past of, of bringing artists that are very much in demand and then we raise the price on the secondary market and that leads to obviously difficulties when a 20 year old artist that wants to have a, a career into her, her, her um, into the 80s. Um, so private sales is also another option that we saw before. But what I wanted to look at really quickly, just a quick couple of artists. This was lot number one in our most recent evening sale um, by an artist called Michaela Yearwood Dan. She's a London based and London born artist in her late 20s. Um, she uh, is now represented by Grimm Gallery um, and Marianne Boensky in New York. So she's just been picked up for representation in New York. But beforehand, it was just a, um, because of her uh, location here in London, it was just a London-based um, representation. And Grimm has just opened a recent gallery. It's a Dutch gallery, but it's, they've opened a, um, uh, an outpost in London. She is, um, she owns, she's, before this work came up at auction, there were only um, seven other works that had come up at auction um, for her. Um, she was born in 1984, as you can see. She does these lovely um, kind of colorful and, and vibrant and multi-layered and textural works uh, that bring together collage, gold leaf, embroidery. And this is really something that we find that there's um, that people really looking for. The figurative uh, painting in the contemporary space is where most people are looking to, to is most people are producing art, but also what people, collectors want to buy art. So we've seen whether that's perhaps slightly abstracted in the case of Flora Yuknovich, who's um, a wonderful artist, also very young in her 20s, who recreates um, um, in a way abstracted uh, patterns of also old, mastered, uh, old masters painting like Fragonard. Um, but it's, it's very much that vein. And this work, as you can see here, the estimate was 40 to 60,000 pounds and it sold for 730. So I, I, I just, it's, it's just, it's just, a, I want to kind of put into perspective what that means for an artist who, um, 29 years old, um, she um, was part of the Bloomberg New Contemporaries in 2017, which is a kind of uh, um, uh, a wonderful program of that showcases emerging young artists. She won the studio bursary for the New Contemporaries a year later in 2018, um, so that she um, worked on her first solo show at Tawani um, in 2019. Uh, and currently, she's one of a, a, a number of uh, artists in the Rites of Passage exhibition group show at Gagosian. So you can see where that's, that, that's slightly the trajectory is going. But this is just, in a way, slightly um, a, a point to make that it's, it's difficult when you're that young, when you've had that little exposure uh, to the primary market, just come into the secondary market. But then you can see 17 bidders, um, uh, underbidders um, for the, this work, uh, mainly European based because she's not that, had that much exposure um, outside uh, of Europe, but really a phenomenal, phenomenal result. With that result, though, comes um, a, a management structure that you have to kind of slightly put into place because. Um, I just charted really quickly those other, so those seven and, and then the other lot that we just saw works from the first work of hers that came up at Phillips uh, in the day auction in London, in June 22, the steady increase and then the spike. Uh, and this is in a way what happens when you place a work by contemporary artists in an evening sales setting. You imagine being in, 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 in a looking, leafing through um, an auction catalog and seeing a 32 Picasso um, of Marie Therese perhaps um, or Lee Miller and then seeing something like this, there's going to be an element of um, 
uh, cross pollination that's going to happen with, with with the bidding. And so we'll look at that later about kind of the the, the factors involved in bidding. But it's just in, 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 uh, I, I thought about this because it's an incredible kind of chart to kind of look at uh, to see how you need to also slightly be wary of it. And actually, we we've, we were flooded with. Um, um, works by the artist, by people who obviously saw the result and bought the work, uh, perhaps because they loved it years ago, maybe the, the, group, ex the group exhibition. Um, but, you know, we want to maintain it. So actually, there's only one other work that have, of hers that's coming up at auction the next, um, uh, in the next cycle of auctions in New York, which is a smaller piece, just because uh, I, we, that's part of also what we do is controlling that because we don't want to burn out these, these, these poor artists. And the second, um, and this brings me to my second point, the second artist that I want to talk to you about, which is a Scottish artist called Carolyn Walker. Um, she's uh, in her early 40s, so uh, in a kind of strange transition period between perhaps being kind of seen as new and young and contemporary and maybe being, being more mid-career. And she, as you can see on here, she does these wonderful, wonderful, I mean, I love her work. She has these wonderful, wonderful um, um, placid, but also kind of interior exterior scenes um, that she paints beautifully um, from the female perspective, uh, which is another thing that's very kind of important to a lot of our collectors right now. Um, a lot of them are looking to diversify their collection and want to divest from um, male artists uh, and purchase works by female artists or, 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 or artists from uh, different backgrounds. Um, so she's really, and she works in these large formats um, uh, paintings, lovely, uh, uh, lovely, lovely surfaces. And this work here was lot three on the left-hand side. The puppeteer was lot three in the same sale. So when we try to structure the, the, the sale, we tend to want to put the, the things what we call the flyers, the things that we know they're going to do very well at the start of the sale. So hence lot one, Michaela, lot three, um, Carolyn. And they did it incredibly well as well. You can see here the price realized 693 from an estimate of 150 to 200, just because she has she had had more of a of, of a of a history on the secondary market. 16 bidders, because she's also had some interesting shows. She had a the kind of breakthrough moment was 2013 when she had a show at the Pitts Hanger Gallery Manor in London, um, and then she um, also went on to um, have a Woman Observed, which is a great show that was at K11 Foundation in Shanghai. So opened her up to an Asian market. Um, if you those the know K11, it's almost like a um, art mall, they call it, I think, in China, um, from the real estate developer Adrian Chang, where it's just has a plethora of, of shows that are kind of being churned out. And so it's, it's a really important space for young artists, especially a young artist from Scotland coming to Asia. Um, and that really brought out a lot of um, um, Asian buyers, which we probably wouldn't have seen. Her work slightly reminiscent, perhaps more of Hockney with the... Uh, uh, the swimming pool motif, obviously, but also Edward Hopper. So it's 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 a really it's, she's a wonderful artist. But in this way, what she what she's done is that um, I think Artsy came up with the statistics that in 2022, so last year, 32 of her works were sold at auction, out of a 52 total in her whole career. So when you talk about momentum and how the the supply and demand dictates a lot of what we do. This is also incredibly important. So um, a huge amount of artworks that are coming on the market um, for her. But um, um, she's, she's really kind of um, the, the top draw in contemporary sales is the kind of figurative painting still. Now we're having the moment where really that's what people are looking for. Um, and even though these kind of works tend to package perhaps social issues that are circulating in the institutional sphere a little bit more palatably, they're not as hard hitting perhaps, they're still something about them and, and and the fact that she's done these shows and these, and these exhibitions institutions that also allows uh, her to kind of command higher prices um i also wanted to include this because just two days afterwards um uh, phillips uh, uh, had this work threshold from 2014 in its evening sale and it broke the previous days uh previous well, two days previous um auction record uh, for nine hundred twenty-seven thousand um, pounds, so an incredible as well their rise, but obviously one that's a lot more measured. And I also wanted to include really quickly because talking about institution shows and 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 and, and kind of the buzz around an artist coming to market as well. This was a show that she held at this wonderful Gothic Revival uh, cathedral 
um, uh, chapel, sorry, in uh, Fitzrovia on the side of the old Middlesex um, um, hospital. And she was actually um, uh, part of residency at U U UCLH, University College London Hospital, um, to kind of create these incredible, incredibly moving uh, scenes of the birthing and, and maternity ward there uh, and set in these in, in this in this in this lovely lovely space um, and so I think when you have an artist that is yes very um, you know the tr is trending very strong on the market but also has these kind of broad range of um, exhibitions in both uh, localized lo locations um, in the UK or in, in the major centers in Hong Kong or in New York it's really kind of the the um, uh, the holy trio, really, of of of, of getting to, to works at auction. So um, we're very happy to 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 have a lot more work by Carolyn Walker actually next next season. So what I wanted to talk about now, touch on briefly, because I've kind of skirmished around it, but I mean the, the psychology of auctions. Uh, what is it? How do they work? What is it that allows um, uh, sixteen bidders to uh, whether they be online, on the phone, or in or in person to bid up? to an amount that's sometimes x amount 20 times x on, on the on the estimate price because the estimate price is a guide price so in a way we wouldn't really be doing our jobs very well if all of our results were stratospherically over or or below because when we talk about bi works bought in works is when they don't sell uh, so another kind of issue that we obviously don't gloat about as much um, but it's um, it's it's th that's really important. So I want to touch on that very quickly. Um, in 2020, the Nobel uh, Prize for Economics was awarded to two Stanford University economists, uh, Paul Migram and Robert Wilson, um, in their kind of pioneering work on auction theory. Um, Wilson was at the forefront of this um, theory of, of, of this sector in the 60s and 70s. He kind of outlined the underlying idea that many auctions have a common value, so a market price that all bidders share, but each individual has to come to in their own realization. He used game theory to establish the best bidding strategy and how it mostly leads to actually lower bids uh, because people try to avoid the dreaded winner's curse or overpaying for something at auction. So he worked away in the sector and actually his graduate student later on uh, ended up being uh, Paul Migrom. And uh, he added to this framework working together at Stanford, uh, how the idea of private values also influence and augment the common value to the auction outcome and just as much. So these two values correlate. So the private value being obviously when so you have to have something you have to, you must have it, and, and, and you know we'll look at the kind of the factors involved with that and how that drives up the bidding, uh, and that can be something as simple as social uh, or macroeconomic. Um, but these are kind of things that I think are important to look at when looking at the kind of psychology behind the contemporary uh, artists that come uh, come to market. So, macro factors. Um, I, I want to touch on this just because. Uh, a couple of days ago, the um, yearly UBS Art Basel report for the art market came out. They do a, this kind of um, uh, analysis of the art market for, in this case, for 2022. And according to the report, uh, uh, global art market grew 3% as a whole last year. So an estimated $67.8 billion. Uh, so exceeding its pre-pandemic level of 64, just over 64 billion in 2019. However, what the report describes, which is quite telling, is how it's a year of divergence how really much of the art being sold worldwide was concentrated in the top end of the market. So the blue chip names, the, the masterpieces, the collections um, works, and not really the core market that, we looked at, that we'll look at later. Um, interesting enough, they said that auction house is the only segment to show an aggregate increase in sales year on year were for works that sold over $10 million. So for every result like Michaela's or Caroline's, which is highly impressive, there's also a host of other lots that don't perform like that, which is something to kind of obviously take into consideration. Um, and that's interesting, another statistic from the report, taken together, the US, UK, and China make up 80% of the art market globally, 80%. So uh, it's, I think the next country after that is France, but it's really, it, the majority of it is there. So when we talk about um, Karen Walker showing a K11 under Adrian Cheng's 
um, wing or showing a pits hanger or um, uh, Cecily Brown's retrospective of the Met that's just opened. Incredibly important things to happen at the same time as uh, auctions. And we obviously look at that and how, how the two things correlate. Um, so then we have supply, obviously, like I said beforehand, supply and demand, um, the event driven demand, the feeling of being in the room bidding. Sometimes there's something there. They talk about it. Our chief auctioneer UC talks about it all the time, the electricity in the room when somebody needs to go one more and their masters really auctioneers at getting that one more increment, that one more um, uh, step up that bid to then continue going. Um, like I said, social factors, um, you know, you want to show off to your friends that that wall has a lovely, lovely work that you just bought at an auction and you paid that amount for. It's very important, but possibly marketing might be in the marketing behind our auctions is really what kind of drives people to, to consign with us. And as much as it pains me to do this, I have to look at our competitors uh, once, just once, um, for probably the most important marketing moment um, uh, uh, or event, let's say, I'm not going to come over, event in, 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 the, in, in the recent auction history. This photo on the left um, is a photo of the back of the sale room at Sotheby's uh, in Bond Street um, when um, the work Girl with a Balloon sold in 2018. It was the last lot on the sale. Hammer went down 1.4 million USD. And then shortly afterwards, the, the, the sheet of paper that was, that was being framed started to be shred, shredded using a mechanism, a shredding mechanism that was built into the framing of, of the work. And as you can tell by some of the actually quite hilarious faces of some of uh, um, my colleagues at Sotheby's, genuinely shocked. Because they didn't know. Because they didn't know. Because they didn't know. Or they did know. No, they didn't know. <laughs> so, they, so the work um, um, then ended up being um, uh, something that was uh, uh, a stunt that was played out by the Banksy studio. Banksy has this uh, studio called Pest, uh, Pest Control that funny name as well, but they, they, they control and they kind of authenticate and they create certificates for all the words. You can imagine how difficult it is to, to be able to say, I own a public work of graffiti art that I made on so-and-so as well. So they actually have a very well-run and well-organized company behind that. Um, Incredible moment, uh, really kind of it's, it's, it's picked up newspapers everywhere. I think everybody that, even the person that was interested in art or never stepped into an art gallery could, could tell you about that moment. Um, and what happened is that Sotheby's seized on it. And then you can see here for, um, um, Oliver Barker, the chief auctioneer at Sotheby's, uh, now selling uh, the new work um, uh, by Banksy, Love is in the Bin, um, <laughs> in October 2021 for um, $25.4 million. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a jump of roughly 20, 20, 24 million uh, in a couple of years. So, and it obviously it's, it's moved <laughs> from the back of the auction room to the private place next to the auctioneer. So these types of events and this type of marketing behind it, especially considering what had happened beforehand, were are really quite incredible. I mean, I, I didn't want to, Kind of going about Banksy, but too much. I probably should have actually, because it was our, we we sold it. But what Banksy had did an incredibly um, uh, magnanimous gesture and painted this lovely um, uh, uh, work called Game Changer and donated to the Southampton University um, to the hospital in um, Southampton uh, in the middle of the of, of COVID. And um, they obviously found themselves with this work hand painted, which you know in the Banksy market, when so much is stenciling, so much is graffiti, hand painted works are very very rare. Um, uh, and they came to us, they approached us, we sold the work, all the money went back to the NHS. It was a lovely moment because we also obviously like to do a lot of work with a charitable foundations and with institutions and so forth. But just to say that the marketing behind it, the stories behind it are just as important as sometimes the works themselves. Hence why we have um, collect, collection sales, hence why we, spend a, we used to spend a lot of time and money making tomes, books really, for every single um, auction. Um, that we had now we're trying to be greener we move a lot of it online but we do a lot a, a whole host of things but the the event driven d demand um, of, of bidding is, is not to be undervalued and and really there what we've done is like I mentioned before as well the pull of having work side by side when we there's nothing greater I think that when you go to an institution and you see works from 
disparate locations or, or eras uh, together as some sort of curatorial thread or narrative weaves through it. Um, we try to do something similarly within the sales, hence why we decided to put the 20th and 21st century sales as a whole. Um, and all these things um, are, are kind of important. Actually, next, in a couple of weeks' time, we have this incredible, because we're trying to integrate a lot more design pieces, we have an incredible Lalanne hippopotamus bar that we're selling in New York in the evening sale, which is a really big moment for us. Um, and probably none so more than, uh, th than when we sold, we decided to sell um, uh, Salvador Mundi in uh, our evening sale um, in uh, um, 2017. Um, so that was the first time really that work like that was, was sold in, in, in a contemporary um, um, context. You see the, view, the, 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 the buzz that I created, the touring and everything. Um, and that went on to um, you know, sell over 450 million um, do pounds, uh, dollars. So all these things are, are really, really important. But then that kind of brings me on to maybe our reality um, in the kind of post-COVID world, because we, we look at things pre and post-COVID and, and how do you kind of take opportunities and, 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 and make sure that the contemporary space is still available when you're unable to run auctions, you can't have people coming into the galleries, you can't hold them physically uh, events. So all these things, marketing suddenly goes out the window when everybody was at home and just looking at their computers. So um, what we try to do is that we try to really uh, focus on technology. We already started doing that. Um, in 2018, we held our first Art and Tech Summit in New York. We tried to bring in the kind of technological sphere and try to bring it and imbue it into what we do at Christie's. And, um, and we move a lot more um, uh, auctions online. So we, we, we've managed to do that in a lot of sites in Europe where we weren't unable to beforehand. And possibly th the biggest thing that we did was that we made a decision to sell the first NFT or non-fungible token um, in uh, a major auction house when we sold uh, Beeple's every days, uh, the first 500 days uh, in March 2021. It was a single sale online um, of this work, which you can see this is Beeple, this is the artist. It was made up of thousands, or I don't even know how many images um, that formulated the total, the, 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 the final work. An NFT, just as by way of explanation, is non, a non-fungible token. So um, instead of being a fungible token as any commodity that you can pass or trade or recreate, um, a non-fungible token is completely unique. It's a completely unique digital artwork that is created using blockchain technology to make it completely unique and unreplicatable. So these uh, things, when they came th through to us, they were slightly, <laughs> as possibly they might be to you now, alien concepts. Uh, why would somebody buy something that's a JPEG? You can see the New York Times article um, on the day after the, 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 the um, NFT sold incorrectly calling it a JPEG file. <laughs> so it's quite funny that even this, the technology experts or the, the journalists were, were getting it wrong. Um, and you know, this work sold for $69.3 million with fees. Um, you know, something that we thought that was, we didn't know what, what the market was for. You could buy these using um, uh, online uh, tools like OpenSea and Marketplace um, to buy them in the primary market. But we really didn't know what it would happen when we put it um, in an auction. Um, and it was a phenomenal success, 33 active bidders online. Um, the third highest auction price for a living artist after Jeff Koons and David Hockney. So in good, in good company, uh, although you've put, that's why I wanted to put a picture of him because you know, would have never known. Uh, but that's him, Mike Winkleman. Um, uh, he was already a, an established digital artist, so he already had collaborations with um, Louis Vuitton, with pop stars, with different brands. And so he was already known to, uh, as, as a kind of a serious digital artist. He wasn't somebody who then, sadly, after this moment, opened up the floodgates of anybody and anyone making an NFT and trying to cash in on the, the results um, that, that we saw. Um, but, but really what happened is that um, the, the correction in the NFT uh, market since these highs was obviously due to the fact that the kind of um, uh, tulip fever behind uh, the, the NFTs slowly started to get, get a bit more um, um, logical. Um, so when the NFTs, still from the UBS, our Basel report, NFTs sales reached close to 2.9 billion uh, in sales in 2021. Um, so reflecting this kind of feverish enthusiasm for a new unexplored asset class. Um, um, and last year, the report found that the sales dropped to almost, almost 50% to, to, to 1.5 billion. 
just because we were seeing, and we, after we sold this work, we realized it actually was a kind of a watershed moment uh, and people uh, had, uh, that wanted to buy into this to kind of get a seat at the table or get a, um, uh, an understanding of what it meant to be part of, in a way, history, then didn't really translate to the artwork behind it. So now what we do is that we still include NFTs in some of our, uh, in some of our uh, sales, but we curate a lot more. Uh, what we supply, what, what we present to market. That means working with digitally native artists, artists that have been working in the digital space uh, as part of their practice for a while, uh, or things like uh, artists like Urs Fischer, who is now the Swiss artist who's, uh, you know, traditional artist as well in the traditional format mediums, but now working in the NFT space as well. And so that helps a lot um, to kind of understand it. But it's a huge, huge thing, you know, for us because being a very traditional, um, in a way, or fashion maybe, I want to whisper it, kind of auction house, this really made us realize that, that we are, we're at the forefront of the, of the, of the front guard of really of, of doing something. So we realized that we could take uh, bold steps um, and make decisions in terms of bringing um, uh, new artists to market. And um, we, um, we've we just created um, a, a metaverse gallery uh, in Web 3.0 uh, for Christie's to sell and, and, and show work. Um, so if, if you want to look at art digitally within the metaverse, not in real life, but in, in, in the web, they can. Um, we accepted cryptocurrencies as, uh, as payment. Um, not so good now during the crypto winter, but still um, important. Um, and we've, um, we started to kind of work a lot more with um, <clears throat> cutting edge artists. This, uh, this, these images here are of um, Beeple's Human One, which was the first work by people to also not be an NFT, but be a physical um, object. And what was interesting about it is that uh, we sold it as well, um, but then shortly afterwards, uh, it was displayed at Castello Rivoli, which is the first um, purpose-built contemporary art museum in Italy, in Turin. Um, in this wonderful exhibition, you can see Francis Bacon uh, b behind him. Um, you know, so this dialogue, between the kind of uber new, the really the, 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 the cutting edge and, and the historical was um, in a way kind of validated for us because we were putting our uh, artists that then ended up being and then actually he ended up going to the M plus um, museum uh, in Hong Kong as well. Um, and then here we have um, uh, Casa Batlo, which is a, which is a very uh, famous um, building in Barcelona by uh, um, Anton Gaudi. Um, and this, uh, we worked with this digitally native artist, Graphic Adol of Turkish American descent, uh, who creates these wonderful kind of um, um, NFTs. Uh, he mapped out and studied using technology that is beyond my uh, understanding uh, the movement of uh, all these streams of, of tourists through the house. And then I wish I could show you a video of it. But um, this was projected onto the, uh, the building in Barcelona and the building reacts as the people react through the building. And then we sold the work as well in our evening sale in New York where we had this incredible kind of 10 meter high structure screen that would display the NFT on there uh, in Rockefeller Plaza where we have our offices. So it, it, it's, it's, it's about kind of like bringing together as well a lot of these things. And, and, and sometimes we got it wrong um, these are some of the um, uh, kind of collectibles that the NFT world also brought up. Um, the Bored Ape Yacht Club, um, um, the uh, CryptoPunks, uh, and then the kind of consumer tie-ins with Tiffany's offering these pendants. So in a way, the, 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 there's, there's, there's also kind of the, the, the collaborative aspect of some of these um, that, are, that are quite interesting. But then also, this is an NFT, which is... I just touch on really quickly that we sold as well of, of a model, um, Emily Ratajkowski, who um, uh, Richard Prince, the, 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 Ameri the New York based uh, um, artist, uh, did a series of works where he appropriated a, or took images from Instagram and then created canvases of those images. You know, he was trying to kind of understanding of the idea of appropriation and who owns works because nobody owns the images that they put on social media. Um, and so then what she did is that she went and contacted Richard bought the work back for, uh, of herself. This is her posting an image of her on the cover of Sports Illustrated and then creating an NFT called Claiming, um, Claiming My Body Back and then selling it uh, and, then, and, then, and then as an NFT. So in a way, this kind of like meta almost system where the technology allows people to do that. So giving a lot of, a lot of um, um, agency 
um, to, to, to people. So we're very, very, um, very happy about that. Um, collaborations are an incredibly, incredibly important aspect of what we do, like, uh, which we'll touch upon now. Um, in two weeks' time, we're going to have uh, the second uh, part of the SI Newhouse collection, um, the first uh, um, part of the collection uh, where we sold this Jeff Koons, which ended up being the uh, most expensive um, um, artworks sold at auction before um, uh, Andy Warhol's uh, Sage Shop Maryland. Um, and we have this wonderful collection um, from Feinberg, um, Jeffrey Feinberg, who is a Boston um, real estate mogul. You can see up here uh, my colleague Adrian um, hammering down on a cell rat in the visionary, the Paul Allen collection, uh, which we looked at really quickly, which was just incredible uh, in terms of museum grade works that we had in the old building that we managed to sell. So these are incredibly important things for us because the provenance, because of the um, um, people behind it and where they came from. This in line with the contemporary market is really important because this is what elevates the, the, those, those, those works up. And so, you know, George Michael sale in March 2019 that we had in London, incredibly important thing. And, and what I want to touch upon is this work by Jean-Michel Basquiat that's in our evening sale in two weeks' time. Because within this kind of plethora of, 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 of incredible artworks that are being sold by these collectors, there are still works that we want to tr try and sell. And this is an incredibly important work um, by an incredibly important artist, which I just wanted to touch upon because it's the estimate, it's, it says estimate on request on our website, but I'll tell you, it's, we're asking around $45 million uh, for it. Um, but he's such an important um, uh, link between the fine art world and popular culture. These types of, you know, Sotheby's did an incredible sale um, um, curated by um, a Taiwanese pop star called Jay Cho, um, where he sold um, a basket that he owned. Um, there he is. Um, and um, they, when they were, and this is Nigo, a Japanese uh, fashion designer who's also sold um, his collection by Sotheby's. All these things, not only in the Paul Allens and Feinbergs and SI Newhouses, with names that will not really mean a lot to the next generation of collectors, uh, but these names will. And so where, where we can, where Sotheby's can go and source the same chairs that Basquiat sat on for the cover of New York Times Magazine in 1985, when he was still working on the piece, this is unfinished in the background, to then use as the promo material. Uh, it, it, these are the little things that, 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 that make the difference when the work actually then comes to, uh, come to auction. And much like Annie and Idris' uh, collaboration here in terms of showing the works together, it elevates both of them, I feel, uh, to then create something that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Right now, we've got the Warhol Basquiat collaboration exhibition at the Louis Vuitton Foundation in Paris. Incredible show that's, that's, that's getting incredible reviews. And we do that as well at Christie's. We, we have a lot of private selling exhibitions. We teamed up with um, um, curator Andrea Emmerlei for um, uh, Bold Black and British, an exhibition of contemporary black artists um, at Christie's last year, uh, which was an incredible success. Um, we worked on um, um, uh, raising funds for the MPG for the reopening in 2019. Um, so these collaborations are key to it. How does this fit within the kind of popular culture um, remit that, that, that we want to discuss? Well, I, I just took a couple of, of, of instances here to kind of highlight how, how deeply permeated it is because this is, a, this is Louis, and I'm not trying to single out Louis Vuitton, but they really are kind of at the, at the forefront of, of these partnerships. This is a, a Jeff Koons um, handbag. I'll move on. This, <laughs> this is a, a recent collaboration uh, between Yoi Kusama, um, the Japanese uh, artist, uh, and Louis Vuitton, where um, her kind of famous polka dot motif is emblazoned and everywhere. Uh, so much so, it, the, the power of, 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 of her brand is so strong that they have an animatronic Yayoi Kusama in, in, the, in the windows out of the Louis Vuitton stores in New York and Tokyo and, and, and London, um, eclipsing really the brand. So, you know, the brand here is getting a lot more cultural capital from the artists of the other way around. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. And this is where it can backfire. 
because this was in the news a, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, Louis Vuitton had started this um, uh, advertising campaign featuring the French actress Lia Sudo, where they were just selling a normal uh, handbag, nothing with polka dots or da Vinci uh, prints on it. Um, but they use as a backdrop um, uh, um, uh, uh, Joan Mitchell uh, work uh, from the American artist that uh, um, was on at the time at the Louis Vuitton Foundation. It was a lovely exhibition of that also riffed on uh, Monet and uh, and 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 and, um, and Mitchell. Uh, but they didn't get clearance for the for, for the image. They had to take everything down. So the foundation removed it, saying they didn't because perhaps they didn't want to be associated. It's not that type of an artist, you know. Obviously, it's a, it's an estate now. Um, uh, Mitchell having died in uh, 1992, but you know, this is this is where kind of these collaborations um, m might become a little bit more uh, difficult to kind of um, to bring together. And I'll I just I'll, I'll I'll run through a couple of more things. This is this is the basket exhibition, Warhol basket exhibition at Louis Vuitton, which I urge everybody if you're in Paris to go and see. Um, this is where the new artist then comes in collaboration aspect comes into effect. These are three album covers that I chose from, um, at the time, maybe not so much now, in, at the time, incredibly cutting edge musicians. Um, the first one is, is, is the cover of uh, Frank Ocean's uh, album, Blonde, with an image by Wolfgang Tillmans, the German uh, photographer. The second one, uh, th th this one is a George Kondo painting uh, commissioned by Kanye West for his album, um, My Beautiful Twisted Fantasy. Uh, and this is, this is where then, perhaps artists that were known, Wolfgang Tillman's known very well for documenting kind of <coughs> Berlin 90s uh, or London 90s rape culture and scenes, replenishing that connection with the new generation. Um, uh, Kanye West actually talks about, uh, Con George Conner actually talks about the fact that um, uh, Kanye West commissioned this painting because he wanted it to be as explicit as possible because he wanted to get banned. So going back again to the kind of event, the marketing behind it. And then this is, um, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to lead on, uh, an album cover for um, a hip-hop artist called Jay-Z, and um, uh, where it's, it's not an artwork, but very clearly, I think you can see Louise Nevelson's um, assemblage works uh, with, a, with a kind of assembling of disparate objects, painting them white, and perhaps maybe, maybe we can even see a Donald Judd stack in the middle as, 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 as the emblem. So these are all to say, and this is, this is actually something that's, that's quite interesting. This is in terms of how that link is played out over time. This is an image that was used by Ernie Barnes, an American artist, that was used as the front cover album for a 1976 album by Mar uh, Marvin Gaye called I Want You. And we sold it last year in New York uh, with an estimate of 150-200 and it went $50 million. Um, dollars. Um, uh, it was also used as a front cover for a US TV show, which I wasn't aware of, called Good Times, uh, which um, the, the buyer, this is, the, the, it's a duplicate copy actually, it's a second copy, the original is owned by Eddie Murphy, but um, the owner of um, the buyer of, of, of the work said that to some people, this image, he, he's a commodity trader from Houston, um, African American, he said, this, for my culture, this w image is as, as important as the Mona Lisa, and he would have bid three times that amount, he said. So an incredible, I think it was like 15 minutes of bidding, there were two people, they wouldn't let it go. It went on and on, and everybody was aghast because we did, we'd never really sold the artist. We'd sold them in day sales and, and smaller smaller formats, but this was really when it when it became. And this is the kind of the cultural kind of capital that comes with the with these works. And I just want to touch on upon this is more of this. This is this is uh, Beyonce and and her husband Jay Z shooting a music video where they managed to have the Louvre closed off. Um, and that's them in front of the Venus, uh, the Samaracha in front of the, the uh, Mona Lisa, uh, you know, taking in the sights without any visitors, as you do. As you so, do. <laughs> uh, and then finally, sometimes going back to when it can go wrong, this is a video for Beyonce's, uh, one of Beyonce's lead singles from her critically acclaimed Lemonade album, which was pretty much frame for frame. You can find it on the internet, frame for frame, a recreation of Pipi, a Swiss artist Pippi Lotti Wrist's 1997 video work. Um, which was her walking down the street, um, um, breaking windows from uh, parked cars. So, uh, and, 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 and there's, there's, a, there's an element of kind of the contemporary then moving hand in hand with these, um, uh, with these artists. Um, and then we can talk about film. This is the, uh, um, um, this is the um, uh, cafe at the Prada Foundation uh, in Milan uh, that Mutual Prada uh, asked Wes Anderson to design. 
um, uh, the square, uh, brilliant movie about the art world satire. Um, uh, my wife told me I should have gotten rid of that one because I'm aging, uh, dating myself, but that's a Sex in the City. But I wanted to talk about here about um, sometimes how social media um, can also help um, and, and how it, it, it's, uh, it's also influencing these artists because it, social media allows people, uh, young artists, to maybe bypass uh, the gallery system. I'm not saying that the gallery system should be bypassed, but it's another way for them to bring and market and bring their work um, uh, to uh, people. This is uh, Genevieve uh, Figgis, um, an artist that is now very much in demand. Um, and um, she's um, an Irish artist. And in uh, 2013, she started posting images of her work on Twitter and was contacted by Richard Prince again possibly because he was working on his series on Instagram, <laughs> um, to buy one of her artwork. And then after that, he spoke to his representative gallery. Now she's represented by Amin Recht. Her, her work sells into six figures. Last book we sold, 600,000 USD a hammer. So, you know, it, it's fair to say that it's not, not everything is bad and the kind of the embracing of some of these uh, um, kind of factors that you bleed into popular culture in, in, are, are really quite important. And I just want to end really quickly uh, on something because uh, I went to see the uh, Frank Auerbach exhibition at um, um, Hazlitt, Holland and Hebit um, that's just across the road from our, from, our, uh, from our office the other day. And I was struck at how incredibly vibrant and full of life these self-portraits are. He's 92 this month. Um, these are some of the first self-portraits he's ever made. I think he made only a few in the 50s on, on, on drawings on paper. Um, and then now finding this incredible tonal color palette um, of kind of pinks and greens and reds. And um, uh, it, it's just to kind of, it, to, end my, to end my talk really, to say that, you know, as much as we talk about the new, make it new, make it contemporary and all these, there's still something to be said about maintaining a steady, tracked uh, and to keep on doing what you're doing much as, as Frank has done uh, for all these years so I urge you all to see the show um, and that's it I just wanted to show here this is the amount of works that we're selling in two weeks time in New York Kirstie's um, 949 lots so to make you think that's just us then there's Sotheby's there's Phillips there's Bonhams there's the, so 